Good morning, Matanistas. I'm about to leave San Liurtha. However, that doesn't mean it's the end of my Turkish adventure. It just means that a new city is on my horizon. And today I'll be travelling to Mardin, which is further east into Anatolia, 30 kilometres from the Syrian border and not too far away from Iraq either. The city's supposed to have great food, great architecture. What more could you want? A lot of those younger adventurising vloggers will now show you how they go with their backpack on a rickshaw or a taxi to the bus station and travel on a really cramped slow bus, but not me. I'm going to have a Turkish coffee and go by taxi or private car. I've arrived at my hotel. It took about two and a half hours to get here. Pretty stunning scenery on the way and a very fast road actually, a near motorway nearly all the way. The highway actually extended on to Iraq but thankfully the driver didn't take any wrong turning. Anyway, my hotel room is really rather quaint. It's an old stone building and in fact that's how the whole hotel's built and I've been told there are views I should take from the hotel rooftop before I go out. I've had a couple of bananas to eat all day, so food is on its way swiftly, Matanistas. Anyway, let's catch that view. And how is that? Sorry about the drilling or whatever's going on in the background, but this is well worth seeing. Now, this video is going to probably feature a bit more culture and a bit less food. A, because I think the food isn't totally dissimilar to my last couple of stops, but also because there is something spectacular to see. And of course, I'm staying in the old town. Always a good bet if possible. It does mean there are lots of stairs to carry bags up, but it does sort of mean that you're in the heart of the action. There is actually a modern city with lots going on below this, but I'm not gonna walk up and down there because, wow, I mean, it's probably about a seven or 800 meter climb. Maybe I'm exaggerating a bit, but the car I was in was certainly toiling away. This old town is very well set up for tourism, actually, except for I don't think they've got much for years, and it's certainly way off the radar for foreign tourists. Maybe it gets a lot of Turkish tourists. Bit strange, that, really, but help is at hand. I have found somewhere where I can have a little something. Another thing is I see alcohol available more frequently. I've passed two wine stores already. Now, I understand that this area used to be populated by Assyrians. More latterly, it's now a few Assyrians, Kurds and Turks. But the Assyrians are famous for making their own sweet wine. Might try some of that later. Hopefully, they've got some dry stuff as well, because sweet wine doesn't really do it for me. Right, I have managed to find somewhere where I've ordered a few things, and I'm not sure whether this is Turkish or Syrian, because the name of my main dish is called Aleppo Pan. And Aleppo is a big, now mostly destroyed city in the north of Syria. But first of all, we have some lentil soup, a mini lamashin, I think, and the usual side salad and iron. Okay, the soup is exactly as you'd expect. Lentil soup is like a staple here, but if I see a non-lentil soup anywhere, a vegetable one rather than a meat one, like the bayram, I will go for it and tell you what it's like. Now. 
that's pretty good, but I'm not actually sure that's a lamashing because it's quite spicy, that is. No, it is a lamashing. I think it's just their own particular recipe. And I have to say, these lamashings are very consistent wherever you go. I've not had a bad one yet. Or maybe the lamashing experts amongst you will say, oh, we've not had a good one yet. Now for the Halep Tava, as it's called in Turkish, or the Aleppo Pan. Well, information was scarce on the web. I asked for a translator and they said it's lamb. So let's give it a try. I did read something about it maybe being a bit sweet and sour. No, I don't really taste any sweetness, but it's quite a nice skillet fried lamb dish with onions, aubergines, I think spring onions rather than onions and tomato pretty tasty and with a bit of rice it makes a nice change from all those kebabs i've been having now let's try a bit with the rice mm, nice combination not a dish i've heard before but it makes a nice pleasant change to a kebab and given it's sort of late afternoon it's not going to put me off my dinner it's not going to be too filling Anyway, I have one of my short daily kebab videos to do tonight, which will have been out a month or so before this, or even two months, and I will see you tomorrow where we'll roll the vlog on and hopefully see some more of the stunning architecture of Mardin. <laughs>Well, things never run smoothly on mutton tours and I overdid it a little bit on the Syriac wine last night. So I'm going to have a couple of snacks, get the famous local double shave and roll things on till tomorrow. Good job I prepped my schedules out so I have extra days just in case things like this happen. Now just a place I want to show you, the Lalo shop. They have their own wine there actually, but the main reason I went there is because I saw a big Lavazza sign out there and their espresso was the best I'd had in this town. They speak English and even helped me get a taxi to the nearest mobile phone shop, which is down in the old town, and get some more data because the phone signal in my hotel is so bad and it has been in some other places that I'm eating through data, mobile data, that is like bilio. Now, having not researched this place, the Oz Yasmin Pide, it seemed to be full all day, and there is a snack here, which I hope they have, which I haven't yet had, called Sembusek. So I ordered one lamachine, you know, the thin meaty pizza, and a sambusek. Now I've had Lebanese ones, and in my experience, or in my recollection, they've been like little meat pies. I'm guessing it won't be too different here, but as always, there'll be slight variations in the flavour and recipe. Okay, the goodies have arrived, and whilst I was waiting, it wasn't really long at all, it was literally five minutes, I noticed they serve a lot of pides here. Now, although I thought that was a dish from the Black Sea Coast and Trabzon, apparently some of the varieties are from eastern Anatolia, but a bit further north than here, and I suspect this makes a pleasant change from kebabs and rice around here. Side dishes, esme, cabbage, lemon, and the sambusek and the pide. I have to say, they look rather similar, but I don't see how they can be similar. Now, when I've had the Lebanese version of these samba sets, they've been really thick, heavy, pastry-laden pies. So I must admit, I was expecting a thick pastry-laden pie. Maybe this is the local variation, although I think it might just be the way the shop does it, because this looks like a slightly different way of folding a lamashin. Pretty good, though. The Esme is really nice. It's not actually that spicy, but it has such a great, rich tomatoey flavour. Maybe there's something about the local tomatoes here, but in terms of the tomato content, that's probably as good as I've had in Turkey. Now, the la machine itself. Of course, I've shown you this on quite a few other videos. Very thin dough, no cheese, just minced meat, peppers, herbs, sometimes onion, a good squeeze of lemon, and you've got an absolutely fantastic snack. And I can understand why they're full here, 
and that's because they make these really well light crispy dough the meat doesn't overpower the rest of the flavors it's obviously freshly baked high turnover clean restaurant robert's your uncle now on for the iron drink Although it's come in this little bottle, I'm guessing that's commercially made. It's quite good, but some of the homemade ones, especially the ones in the big cups with all the froth on the top, are the best ones in my opinion. But still, this is pretty good. And I know some of you actually don't like this. I'm not sure why, because it's just yoghurt and a bit of salt and maybe a bit of water added. Anyway, Matanistas, this little snack has filled a hole rather nicely. I will get on with this before heading across the road to a barber shop, which seems to only have one chair, I think, or maybe two chairs, for that famous local double shave. So let's see if we can communicate here. I'm looking forward to this because my face is a bit of a mess at the moment. But the before and the after. Okay, I'm going to have to take the microphone off because it's going to get in the way of my big chin. So I'll put it back on when the shave has been completed. And there we have it, folks. The famous Mardin double shave. Really, really close. Got a head massage, balm, aftershave. Had my eyebrows, ears, nose, back of my head tidied up as well. What an excellent service. If only we got that back in Manchester. And that set me back the princely sum of 100 Turkish Liras. I think about £4.30. So no machinery used other than an electric thing for the back of the head. The actual main shave was all done with a blade. Now after years in the UK of barbers only cutting your hair or trimming a beard, now the shave is available, but I've never seen a double shave before. Okay, so before we move on to tomorrow's archaeology, let's have a little sweet snack to round the day off before we roll over the video. And if you remember, I visited part of this chain in Istanbul and had a halwa, which was a little bit different to the type I'd had in Pakistan. So let's give it another go here in Mardin. What types of halwa do you have? Uh, halwa. Uh, five halwa. Five different. Yeah. Hot, normal yeah. halwa. Yeah. Uh, and pistachio, yeah. lotus pisco, yeah. uh, chocolate and yeah. mixed fruit. Chocolate and mixed fruit, wow. Yeah. Okay, I'm being given a little taste of the eight fruit, which I think is based on ice cream. Pistachio. Well, I like the eight fruit. But I like the pistachio as well. Oh dear. Here comes the normal hot howler. So I'm going for the normal hot variety, but with ice cream, which is somewhat different to what I'm accustomed to. Okay. I'm not sure what that is, but I'm guessing it's something you traditionally squirt on top. And a few more nuts, of course. And more pistachios, very important. And there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the holy trinity at a halva shop, water tea and the halva itself. Okay, here goes. The hot halva tastes very similar to the Pakistani style halva, which was usually made from carrot, but sometimes from pumpkin and other vegetables. This, I'm not quite sure what it's made of, actually, I'm going to ask him. But the big difference is it's served on top of ice cream, which is something I've not had before. Mm. Actually goes quite well together, actually. So, traditionally here, it's made from tahini, flour and syrup or sugar. But I have to say, as always, with these helmets, they're not actually as sweet as you think they are. A lot of Middle Eastern and South Asian desserts are ridiculously sweet. This one, not so. So I will finish this and then go for a stroll along the wonderfully illuminated architecture in this old town. And I will see you tomorrow. <laughs> Oh,
morning, Matanistas. I promised you something special in the archaeological department, and yes, here we have it. I have come to the ancient archaeological ruin of the old city or town of Dara, seven kilometres away from the Syrian border, right in the heart of Mesopotamia. I've only seen photographs of this, but when you arrive, boy, what a sight. It is awesome. So let's go and fully explore this. Now some of you looking at this city built into rocks or caves might think it's some ancient site where prehistoric or very old man used to live before Christ, some sort of city of cave dwellers, but no, not at all. It is actually something that was built by the Romans. It kind of existed before then, but this is more or less the eastern extent of the Roman Empire, where they clashed or bordered with the Persian Empire, and because there were no natural fortresses in the area, the Emperor Justinian decided that this should be built up into an area where his forces could rest and recuperate. And as the Roman Empire fell, it was abandoned and fell into disuse and disrepair. However, it was associated in 1915 with some rather unsavoury activities in the Armenian Massacre, which is still actually a sore point between Turkey and Armenia to this day. And I'm standing in part of the inside excavation of the site. I wish actually a bit more had been excavated. It's not as big as I thought it would have been. Sure, the city's very big, but there's only a small portion of this ancient city that you can visit the interior of. I'm actually 1 meter 70 tall. If you're a bit taller than that, you'll have to do a bit of ducking, otherwise you'll be banging your head all over the place. Well, stick in a big screen, a fridge full of alcoholic and non-alcoholic refreshments, and a city game, and Bob would be your uncle here. Now, I did say earlier that we are only seven kilometres away from the Syrian border. Yes, very true. Also very true that the UK Foreign Office and the US State Department advise against visiting anywhere within 10 kilometres of the Syrian border. Haven't checked for European countries, although their advice is often a little more sensible and a little less cautious. Well, yes, maybe in the time of the Islamic State I might not have visited here, but they've gone. And if there's any military action in this part of the world, it'll be the Turkish military pushing south, not the other way round. Yes, the same applied when I went to Peshawar in Pakistan earlier this year. And I have to say, for those people who say, oh, what about your insurance? It'll be invalidated and what have you. Well, if that's what you're worried about, I'd hazard a guess that you wouldn't be visiting these parts of the world in the first place. And before I came here, I did read of Americans and Europeans happily visiting here earlier this year. So that seemed good enough to me. And for those of you who think coming to areas of the world like this, I'm not talking about necessarily this place, but the part of Turkey generally I'm in, and they say, oh, it's not safe, it's not safe. Well, I'm afraid, in my opinion, you've been propagandised by mainstream media. I feel a lot safer around here than I do in a dark street in a British city or a US city. So, of course, the city was a bit bigger than that, uh, spread over quite a large area. Now we're visiting the dungeon. Of course, not all of the old cities are well preserved, but they've managed to preserve the dungeons here. <laughs> So while my English-Turkish translator translates Zindana's dungeon, is it a dungeon? Is it a temple? 
is it just a cooled living quarters because these stone underground areas do tend to maintain a solid temperature of I think either 10 or 15 degrees depending on how deep they are. Anyway I'll try and look it up because there wasn't that much information available to hand and find out exactly what it actually is for you and leave a subtitle. Okay, before I have to leave a subtitle, Zindan did actually translate as cistern. Makes more sense. So here we have one of the fortified gates to the city. I think this is unmistakably Roman, the architecture, although obviously I'm not an expert on that. But these were the fortified walls that you used to have to pass through to get into the city. Wow, what an overload, what a visual overload, Mutton Easters. I don't normally bring you that much culture and architecture, however, I thought I should do because this is a very under-vlogged, under-reported area, and if I'm not going to do it, who is going to do it? Well, probably the BBC, I suppose. Anyway, it feels like kebab o'clock, and I have to say, I wish I hadn't put this coat on. Even though it's December, in the middle of the day, it's not really necessary. Yes, at night, but it's about 18, 19 degrees here, I think, and I'm sweating away. Let's go and kebab it up, Mutton Easters. OK, so I'm back in Mardin now, and the place behind me, called the Ser i Merdin restaurant, it's very highly rated, it's actually very close to my hotel, yet it seems to keep the most bizarre operating hours. Let's hope they're open now. There are alternatives, but the choice in this old town is actually a little more limited than I thought it might be. Well, I'm getting a bit confused here because there's actually somewhere downstairs as well, which looks pretty busy as well, and I can see him stacking rice up onto a plate over there. I'll have a quick look upstairs first, but actually downstairs is looking a little bit more promising. The main grand finale of a meal is going to take place tonight, so I'm going to go downstairs, I think, because it's actually pretty busy. Fast turnover of food ticks a lot of boxes for me. That is, if I can get a seat in here, because it does look pretty busy. Oh well, nobody's attending to me as yet. A bit of videoing usually gets people going. I did indeed do the trick, and now I have a table. So I'm settled down, but I think the service is going to be a bit slow here, because it is absolutely rammed. The turnover between people coming and going from tables is rapidus in hell. I don't think I've seen many places like this where people eat so quickly and leave. And I won't be eating quickly though, but at least as I can assure you. Side dishes, just sumac with onions and salad, which is fine for what I've ordered. And a bit of Iran is always on the way. Okay, the Iran has arrived, but there's something I don't understand here. It's a bit unusual. Nothing that's going to lessen the enjoyment of the beverage, but let me show you. This, I haven't seen before. A ladle to drink it from. Maybe they just decide that that cup's a bit too big to drink from. I do like the frothy head as well. I don't know if it means it's homemade. Waiter suggested it was special homemade Iran, but who knows? I've had that description attached before to something that tasted suspiciously from the carton. Not that I'd mind that, of course, but okay, let's see what it tastes like. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think that is homemade. I've got used to the taste of the standard carton iron, and that tastes a bit different to me. Now, a starter, we could call it a starter has arrived, but I suspect that both dishes will arrive on top of each other. Is something you're all probably familiar with, stuffed vine leaves, but some other stuffed vegetables as well. I'm guessing that's an aubergine and that's a stuffed pepper. They've not gone overboard with the amount of rice they've put in there, so you get a good ratio of vegetable to rice. Obviously it's got all those Mediterranean flavours of olives and stuff like that, and as it should be, it is served cold. I do not like it when these stuffed vegetable preparations or vegetable starters that are meant to be cold are served hot. I'm not going to dissect the bind leaves, but here we have these stuffed aubergines, so you can see how much rice and stuff there is inside. And the pepper isn't too dissimilar. And I'd say that the pepper is the best of the lot. Anyway, all of this is much needed after clambering up and down some pretty steep stairs at Dara. Especially since I didn't have my breakfast today. And now it's kebab time, and believe it or not, it's been a couple of days since I've actually had a kebab. That's because I've been eating a lot of the local rice preparations. And these are Mardin kebabs. I'm not sure what the difference is between those and Urfa and Adana kebabs, but the little I've read about them suggests that they're made of lamb and they are spicy as well. What the difference is, I don't know. I'll have to taste and see. I can see already that it's been thickened up with bulgur, which makes it different immediately. I'd say it's like a thinner version of an Adana kebab, although it's only going to be lamb here. It's got that spice, it's got some peppers, some onions in the mix, but I don't think it's that spicy, to be honest. And as always, we have to test the chilies out here. Medium, as is most often the case. Our portion size is just right after the vegetables and rice, so I will be back with you when I've polished this off, which will be in no time at all. Well, I was offered a local suite, in fact, rather oddly, halfway through the main course, a couple of the waiters came around asking me, so I told them that I don't really want sugar. Hariri I did have the other day uh, in one of my daily kebab videos, and I have to say, whilst it wasn't unpleasant, it's not something I'd go searching for a second time. Great molasses, water, flour, sugar, nothing special, really. So, a jolly good lunch, and I will be back with you a bit later for the grand finale, not just of this vlog, but of the mutton tour of Turkey. Okay, mutton Easters, for the final meal of today, of this vlog, of this mutton tour, actually, is going to be at Al Baghdadi. I had eaten here quite late on another day after I'd had a little bit too much of the local Syriac wine. The food was good, but I wasn't in the best position to judge it. So I'm back again and hopefully I'll be able to have more pics in the menu because last time it was so late they basically told me they only had one thing left. It was pretty good and the restaurant was well appointed and they spoke English. So let's go in and have another go. And as usual in this part of the world, lots of stairs to get to where you want to. Just as a time guide, it's quarter past nine. I've been watching the World Cup final, which went to penalties, so I'm a lot later than I even wanted to be today. And yes, that gives you an idea, if a video gets stuck in a queue, how long it takes to actually get them out. Hello. Just one. One reason I've come to this restaurant is because their cooking is highly traditional. They have a section of the menu dedicated to local and traditional dishes. So I've gone a bit overboard and ordered more than I possibly should have done. Never happens, does it, on this channel, folks, does it? Well, my soup and starters arrived at the same time, so I hope the main isn't going to arrive on top of that as well. We have a mixed mezze there. I'm not sure what that is. I think that's aubergine and garlic. Don't know what that is. Olives. 
I think that's a yogurt and pumpkin preparation. That looks like Jajiko Tatsiki, the cucumber and yogurt. The Muamara, which is the nut and tomato paste or pepper paste. And I really don't know what that is. And the soup is a yogurt and coriander soup with chickpeas and bread. Mm. That soup is a revelation. I would never ever have thought of making a soup out of yogurt. It's actually the second time I've had it on this trip and it is wonderful. You get the sourness of the yogurt, the firmness of the chickpeas and the pepperiness of the coriander all in one. I'm getting a slightly meaty taste as well and I think it's been prepared in lamb stock. So the bases are loaded with the meze. I'm going to try them one by one and I'm going to start with the green looking thing and I still can't work out what this is. Definitely something cheesy. It's feta with something but I'm not sure what it is. When I'm done I'm going to scour through the menu and try and work out exactly what it was. The thick yoghurt preparation, wow, there's a very spicy chilli in there. Also tasted the sun-dried tomato, but wow, as well as it. That is very hot. I like it. The nut paste. No, I think that might be sun-dried tomato paste, actually. Maybe some nuts in it. No, it's sun-dried tomato paste, that is. Very nice indeed. Now, what I suspect is jajik or tzatziki. Sort of, yes. Not quite. I can taste something pickled in there. I'm really going to have to look through the menu and identify what they are because whilst the flavours are lovely, some of the ingredients are so unusual I can't pick them out at first hand. Okay, and the interesting looking salad with what looked like some sort of mustard dressing on top. And finally the aubergine salad. <laughs> is an aubergine salad and as usual thankfully no added sweetness why we do that in the uk at turkish restaurants sometimes not always i don't know okay i was right about most of the dishes the thing i was starting to suspect had sun-dried tomatoes was muhammara which i thought was nuts and pepper paste but this tastes very tomatoey to me Maybe it's possible to add a bit of tomato. Now, the yoghurt and chilies was yoghurt and chilies. The green thing was a local cheese. And this aubergine preparation here was aubergine with tahini, which makes it somewhat different to the normal sort of aubergine fry that's made into a cold meze. I'll have to check the actual Turkish name. Anyway, the mystery dish here, which tasted as if it had pickles in it, was called Mardin Hava. I'm going to have to look that up. In fact, having tasted pickle the first bite, now I'm tasting great. So my taste buds are probably all at sea here. Doesn't matter, it all tastes great. Right, I've done a pretty good job on that meze plate. Not eaten it all because I want to enjoy my main. I can still feel that chilli, but what I would say is that the little pomegranate that's in the middle of the tray does act as a natural palate cleanser in between bites of various meze items. Right, the main's arrived and as soon as I looked at the menu the main wasn't the issue there was only ever one choice and it is the roasted goat and paprika on a bed of yogurt. Of course only one thing to drink with that the good old iron. Not quite sure why it's garnished with a bit of Glasgow salad but I'll eat it anyway. And it appears to be not just on a bed of yoghurt, yoghurt and toasted bread as well. And it is absolutely scrumptious. Goat, if you remember my series in Pakistan where they call goat mutton, is leaner than lamb, but it's also, in my opinion, a little more flavoursome than lamb as well. Interesting that it can be both at the same time. I think it's been pan fried. So tender and meaty. And even though in the West it's not a popular combination, yoghurt, in my opinion, goes beautifully with red meat, whether it be lamb, goat, beef, or whatever other red meat you may be consuming. 
Anyway, I need both my hands to polish this one off, and I'll be back with you when it has surely been polished off to smithereens. And I forgot to add, just in case you ever come here and you're worrying, it is off the bone. Anyway, I'm going to let those rich flavours of garlic, goat, paprika and yoghurt swim around my mouth, and I'll see you in a bit. That was really rather splendid, Mutton Easters, but it was a very heavy dish, as you'd expect, with the goat and the yoghurt. Have I got room for any more? Well, could I manage a wafer thin mint? Well, it depends how wafer thin the mint is. Okay, there's one dessert that I haven't brought you on this mutton tour of Turkey. It's not particularly from here, it's a nationwide thing. It's called sutla, sutla, and it is the Turkish style of rice pudding. No idea whether it's any different to normal rice pudding, but it does have a lot of nuts, which obviously does make it a bit different. I suspect the taste is going to be similar to other versions in other countries, but we'll give it a go. Mind you, in terms of its consistency, it's actually rather hard set. No, I didn't expect this at all. It is completely different to what I think. I can taste that there's rice involved in the preparation of it, but it's more like a lightly set mousse and has similar flavours, to be honest, to the cream underneath the hard top of a creme brulee. Most interesting. I'll have a second taste to confirm there. And you can see what it looks like underneath the top. And I expected the pistachios to be sprinkled on top, but what also surprises me is the use of walnuts. Matanistas, a beautiful meal in beautiful surroundings, a fitting way to end the mutton tour of Turkey, from Istanbul to Trabzon to Gaziantep to Urfa to here in Mardin. I do have a couple of days left in Istanbul at the end of this. Those are for my relaxation. I'm not going to shoot another video. My highlights of the tour, well, the variety of foods you could get in Istanbul and the cosmopolitan nature of the city, the huge sprawling city spread over two continents over the Bosphorus. The Samela Monastery up near Trabzon, the kebabs of Gaziantep, the best kebabs I had in the country. Urfa was more of a pilgrimage site, and here in Mardin, the most stunning scenery I saw on the trip, although the main tourist drag in the old town has gone a little bit too touristy. But wow, Dara, that was a sight to behold. And to be honest, the views from this city and the old buildings are quite spectacular. Not the best food city, not that it's a bad food city or anything, but compared to Gaziantep and Istanbul, not quite as good. If there are any parts of the tour that you liked or disliked or any places that you think you fancy visiting, why not drop me a line? Leave a comment in the comment section below. Anyway, at this point, Matanistas, I'm going to have to love you and leave you. There's a whole ton of content coming your way, so keep liking, keep sharing, keep subscribing, but most of all, don't forget, you can't beat a bit of mutton.